coming from my extreme right, uh, Mr. Paul Werditikit, who's the managing partner of Pantera Capital. Jonathan Larson, he's the chairman and CEO of Ping An Global Voyager Fund, and also the chief innovation officer of Ping An Group. Um, then I have William Baubin, who's the managing director of Orbit Startups. And last but not the least, I have Lucy Gasmerian, who's a Token Bay Capital founder and managing partner. Thank you so much for joining me here in Dubai. They've come from different parts of the world. Uh, and I'm sure they bring a lot of perspective with them. So now, just to give you a brief introduction, folks. I mean, six months ago, it started with FTX. Uh, in November, suddenly everyone hears that one of the poster childs of the industry, of the crypto industry, FTX has blown up. And that came as a shock. And then there was a bigger seismic change, which happened just in March which kind of was a deja vu moment, reminded many people of 2008, the Lehman Brothers, when SVB collapsed in the United States, which was really the bedrock for the technology startup industry in the United States. So let me begin by asking all of you to answer in just one or two lines before we deep dive in. Uh, and maybe we can start with you, Paul. Just your quick takeaway on the events that have unfolded. Of course, we have had SVB that collapsed two months ago. And then we had FTX, which happened uh, six months ago. What does this mean for the wider industry, uh, whether it's technology or fintech or just uh, fundraising? Yeah, I mean, I'll start off with FTX. You know, I would say that the, uh, the short sentences around that were that it was fraudulent. It wasn't representative of blockchain and you know, there's really an opportunity that will stem from the collapse of FTX, especially in terms of the investment landscape. On the SVB side of things, uh, this was a situation that affects not only the crypto industry, but also startups in general. And so from the crypto perspective, you know, the downfall of SVB really actually helps the crypto industry in terms of like a forcing function for diversification and de-risking in terms of bank partnerships. Two very interesting thoughts over there, and we'll come back to that, Paul, about uh, you know, both the fallouts. I'll come to you, Jonathan. What do, what, what do you see? I mean, was this really a deja vu moment, especially for the traditional wider uh, industry, uh, especially what happened with SVB? I think... Um <clears throat> Samir, thank you. Firstly, thank you for having me and uh, having Ping An represented here in Dubai. We appreciate that. Um, I think uh, these two events are quite interesting, and I think it's interesting to put a historical perspective on them. If you think about um, the timing, we're now 15 years after the global financial crisis of 07, 08. And if you worked in a big financial institution pretty much anywhere in the world, the central theme of regulation, of internal compliance, and frankly, management attention for almost all of those institutions has been, how do we make sure we learn the lessons of 07, 08, and that they never recur again? And it is simply mind-blowing to me that we have multiple $200 billion plus institutions failing through uh, the consequence of basic failures in elementary ALM management, whether it's having long-dated mortgages and simply not hedging the duration gap, which is totally hedgeable in the United States, or in the case of SVB, owning bonds and simply not marking them, not even taking a capital charge below the line, which the large institutions are required to do. So I think, I think it's, what that tells us is the lessons haven't been learned, and it tells us that the revolution of fintech has really barely permeated the financial industry. Um, we're only at the beginning of that. I think FTX is almost the flip side of that. It's showing a, a very immature, fraudulent, yes, but just very poorly constructed, highly speculative kind of manifestation of fintech. And instead of solving the problems of the financial system, it's actually creating problems. So um, let me leave it there, and we can talk more about both of those point, points of view, perhaps. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to get you in, uh, William, on that, what Jonathan was saying, especially with regards to the lessons learned probably after 2008 and then kind of forgotten uh, in a few years from then. How do you view the events that have unfolded? Yeah, I, th I think for both sides, um, we need uh, more regulation. We actually need clearer regulation, smarter regulation, but definitely more regulation. I mean, after 2008, there were a lot of rules put in place um, that uh, might have saved SVB, but those laws were walked back uh, by government in the U.S. Um, for the crypto side, um, if you just take a look at the U.S., uh, the regulation is based on interpretation of you know, some really age-old uh, laws, uh, and it's extremely difficult to know what you're supposed to do, uh, which is why many companies just choose not to play in the U.S. Uh, so uh, for, for BitMEX, which we backed um, three years ago, um, you know, they, they basically, well, they, they weren't in the market, um, but they fell afoul of a, a set of laws that uh, technically probably shouldn't have applied to them. Uh, and I think right now you're going to have the, uh, you know, the, the markets that are participating um, in blockchain and crypto and the markets that are not. And so uh, we think that the really driving good regulation uh, is the key. Uh, Lucy, you know, you look at the crypto space very closely. You could argue that the fall of FTX was more to do with greed and fraud. Um, but from where you sit, what do you see as the major takeaway from this incident for the wider crypto industry? So, you know, these were two events where customers really lost out. Um, and the sort of similarity is that they're both centralized, centralized players. Um, even though the perception for FTX to be crypto and blockchain and relying on this new technology, it still failed in an epic fashion, right? It's gone down as one of the biggest frauds in US financial history. I mean, it's absolutely enormous um, fraud case. And so I think the failure of FTX has really rattled everyone's belief in crypto and blockchain because there's a misconception that FTX equals that technology, whereas it actually doesn't. It was old fashioned fraud and it was a centralized player where human manipulation brought about the downfall. Um, obviously, risks were also mismanaged, but essentially they were funneling off customer deposits into a highly speculative sister trading firm. Um, now, you know, that, that's just no way to look at it other than, than fraud. Um, with SBB, it's a bank failure. That being said, banks do fail. In 2008, hundreds of banks failed. Um, so yes, I think, to, to Jonathan's point, it's mismanagement, if they're not managing duration risk correctly. Um, but I think more, more of a normal failure. So the takeaway is, sadly, that FTX has tainted perceptions of crypto and blockchain. And I think people's understanding of the space was already very sort of you know, elementary in a way. People haven't quite got their heads around it. So it's really set the industry back um, from a perception standpoint for, for, with investors, with customers, with the whole sort of, you know, um, understanding of the ecosystem. So takeaway is pretty negative, but the positive side is it wasn't about the technology and the technology is going to be uh, the saving grace and happy to talk about that later on in the panel. I'll get you in, I mean, it's a very interesting point, uh, Paul, which Lucy raised about how the collapse of FTX has really led to the loss of trust and in terms of perception about crypto where, you know, it's still at a very elementary stage, the understanding of it. How do you rebuild from here? Where do you go from here in terms of rebuilding the perception and winning back that trust? Yeah, I mean, as, as Lucy mentioned, I mean, it was, uh, it was a matter of fraud. And when you're early in an industry, you are looking for validation um, when, when you sort of make decisions. And, you know, a lot of times, Folks look at VCs as validation, and VCs got burned in this FTX collapse. Uh, Sequoia and some other top brands, you know, did diligence, but not enough to really sort of catch this thing. So I think at the end of the day, as investors, I mean, we need to continue to, you know, uh, go into detail in terms of doing diligence and not sort of, you know, go into the hype 
the, the bull market and, and making quick decisions just because you know, there's a belief that folks are doing the right thing. And so I think it, it stems from not only institutional investors doing that diligence, but also retail investors doing that diligence too. And I think where we go from here is really now, you know, to, to build up this trust, I mean, I think people are, are saying, well, you know, why do we need to trust other folks? Let's just trust ourselves and let's just trust the blockchain. So in terms of trusting yourself, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities right now for startups to really give the power back to individuals in terms of managing their own custody and managing their own funds. If you hold the private key, you get to control you know, where your funds go. And so I think there's an opportunity for self-custody. I think there's an opportunity for better user experiences, better technology so that you can manage your own funds and also have security, protection, and insurance behind uh, managing your own funds. And I think beyond that, I think there's an opportunity for decentralized finance, whether it's in front of the individual or sort of behind some of these companies where you can actually see where the funds are at any time. You can see who your counterparties are and you can actually see these transactions happening, whether they are transparent or sort of not transparent using things like zero knowledge proofs. So I think there's an opportunity here for the blockchain to really provide that transparency, provide that trust, and I think there's a lot of startups that are going to provide the technologies and maybe even, for instance, the other thing that FTX does is they provide market making services. So, you know, imagine being able to provide your own market making services because there's startups that actually provide you the tools and technology to do that. So I think what we're going to see is the unbundling of both FTX and also SVB so that it's going to give more opportunity for you to actually manage and, and, and sort of uh, see what's going on underneath, uh, which I think is ex extremely the way to actually provide trust is, you know, you don't have to trust anybody. Jonathan, with SVB, it's a very different story when you look at the traditional banking sector. I mean, yes, the crypto space and FTX is still at an early stage. People are still trying to understand that space. But with the traditional space, banking space, it's a whole different story. I mean, you had an event in 2008, and now uh, some lessons were forgotten, and it was kind of a repeat. And if you look at SVB and the impact it's had on the fintech space specifically, I mean, $348 billion in client funds, $173 billion in deposits, out of which 30% were held in early stage tech uh, companies. What does this really mean for this whole ecosystem, the fintech ecosystem and startups and technology, what we have seen, uh, the unraveling of SVB? Well, I think in SVB's case, I think, first of all, um, the US Treasury and the FDIC handled this quite well, actually. And I think their counterparts in the UK with the sale to HSBC did likewise. Um, I think that with the new owners of um, SVB, time will tell whether SVB really is in its kind of um, traditional mode as a go-to primary supplier of financial services to the startup industry generally, uh, not necessarily fintech, but startup, uh, startups in general. The interesting and perhaps ironic thing about um, both SVP uh, SVB, sorry, and First Republic, is that both of them were actually quite strong in the value proposition that they offered customers. And certainly for me, I've always kind of admired these banks uh, in SVB's case because they take the trouble to understand, you know, exactly what the needs of startups are and are open to startups in a way that banks uh, operating in traditional markets simply weren't. And in the case of First Republic, being a banker to the affluent for mortgage finance and for investment. So I think that they're both institutions that had a lot, of, a lot to um, be, be proud of on the customer side. Clearly, uh, they have a lot to be um, uh, uh, embarrassed about, and they had many shortcomings in terms of their internal infrastructure and management. Um, I think if you kind of zoom out from this, there's an interesting perspective, and that is uh, you would have thought um, at this stage with the hundreds of billions of dollars of value that have been ostensibly or putatively created by what we might call the fintech revolution, you know, why is it that the kinds of technologies that would give the transparency uh, that would make 
the kinds of gaps in management at SVB and First Republic simply impossible? Why are they not in place? And I think it's interesting to explore the answer to that question. I think if you look at what's happened in fintech in the last uh, 20 years, starting with, say, a company like PayPal, and then leading through to the, you know, the big acquiring platforms like Stripe, Adyen, and so forth, about 70, 80% of the market value of fintech is actually in the payment space. And most of that, almost all of it, is in some way a extension of the um, Visa, MasterCard, and their equivalent rail systems around the world. And you could think of that development as actually merely a way of facilitating the revolution in e-commerce rather than a revolution in fintech itself. And if you go back to these institutions that have just failed, but if you look at any major bank anywhere in the world, they're all still running on uh, 1980s, 1970s, 1990s, and 2000 era technology, almost without uh, exception. The, the value of contemporary technology, of cloud nativity, of um, modularity, of the use of APIs systematically, encryption at rest and in transit uh, for all data, those are foreign concepts in most institutions other than at a very superficial level. So I think you know one of the takeaways is we're actually very early in the, let's call it the B2B or institutional fintech revolution. That revolution really hasn't happened. And I would argue that you know, these, these two examples of traditional banks are a kind of, in part, a reflection of that. And I think the, on, on the FTX side, I think that we're at a stage now where the, the crypto world and the blockchain world really has to demonstrate the value of its use cases and its utility. Um, I think there are plenty of places where that value could be demonstrated, especially in regard to the registration of different classes of assets and the fractionalization of assets and the efficiency and transparency uh, that they could bring to, to those use cases. But I think we're at a, at a very different stage there, um, as, as my fellow panelists have said. William, mm. Jonathan says we are at the stage of initial stage of, let's say, institutional revolution as far as B2B goes in the fintech space. But the fact is that the collapse of SVB has impacted fundraising, it has impacted startups, it has impacted technology companies. Where do you see, what do you see as the immediate impact in terms of fundraising and how do you think is this going to play out in terms of innovation if startups are not going to have access to funds very easily? Yeah, I think uh, one of the challenges is that the largest venture capital investment in the world comes through the US and right now everybody's hiding under a rock. Um, you know, they're just not writing checks. I mean, normally we're the number four most active VC in the world, but in QFAR we are number one because we just continue to invest. Um, so, I mean, the traditional financial institutions have not solved the problems that uh, much, much of the world has. You know, they're, they're designed for high net worth, or they're designed for large corporates or governments, um, but they do not serve uh, startups. You know, SVB, um, we partnered with them. Uh, if we invested in a company, they would do their due diligence, but they would also just basically grant a bank account. Uh, we also work with First Republic. Um, if you look at, say, at a company in Southeast Asia like Aspire, um, they're doing quite well from what I understand. But it's basically a wrapper around a standard chartered bank account. Why can't standard charter do that themselves? So from a traditional standpoint, there's a problem to be solved. And the traditional players are not solving it. Um, so what we're focused on as early stage investors is what, how can we leverage technology like blockchain, which brings transparency, security, and trust uh, to solve some very, very basic problems for startups for micro, small, medium enterprises, for even consumers, especially in underbanked and unbanked markets. Um, so we've got about 50 investments in this space. Uh, we're super bullish on it because the traditional financial institutions aren't doing their job. That's very interesting, uh, you know, uh, what William just said. I mean, they have 50 investment, 50 companies because financial institutions are not doing their job. How do you see it on the other side of the crypto? The ver I mean, on what the SVB collapse, was because of regulation and the lapses in regulation. On the other hand, you have a different story playing out when it comes to crypto, that it's not regulated enough. So in that sense, do you think the FTX is kind of a silver lining that it will pave way for 
a proper a procedure and a systematic way of laying the, the framework for regulation globally? Is there a playbook that emerges now which others can look at? Yeah. I think, um, you know, there's broadly a misconception that the regulators have just heard about crypto with the downfall of FTX. You know, most regulators in most jurisdictions across the world have crypto asset task force and teams, and they've been in place for six plus years, um, as have all the central banks been looking at central bank digital currencies. They're actually very aware of the direction of travel when it comes to moving anything of value onto blockchains and creating digital assets. And where does that intersect with traditional financial markets and where do the existing regulations kick in? So the idea that FTX, suddenly all the regulators around the world woke up and thought we need a crypto asset framework is, is simply not the case. Um, you know, the US had actually been working very steadily through coming up with very comprehensive guidelines. In Europe, we just had the markets in crypto asset framework announced, which is going to passport crypto businesses across 27 EU states, uh, countries. And that's massive. Um, in Asia, I'm based in Hong Kong, the central bank, the securities regulators, the ecosystem, it's all having a massive coordinated attempt and boost to really create um, a framework, an environment where crypto assets can meet traditional financial markets. So we can move away from, you know, a pretty small um, total addressable market of these cryptocurrencies say they're one trillion today, but the big opportunity lies in kind of tokenizing everything, tokenizing securities, putting money on a blockchain. You know, we all think cash is going to be around, but it's not going to be around that much longer, and cash is moving onto a blockchain as well. So that's also going to be tokenized. Um, so the regulators are there. I think maybe what you could say is that FTX actually created a sen greater sense of urgency to get something out the door. Um, in the case of the US, it actually seems that it had the opposite effect and it just made them all scurry into their you know, rabbit holes and just hide and, and just think, you know, it's, it's very hard to regulate this. Um, and arguably, regulation would not have stopped what happened at FTX. You know, how do you stop sort of backdoor funneling off of client assets using technology that quite frankly, regulators don't understand and couldn't oversee even if they tried to. So um, we're in this weird environment where we know this is happening. The regulators do have an appetite and a, a desire to help protect customers, to help protect um, you know, client deposits, but they're sort of scratching their heads as to the best way to go about that. Um, I would say currently the approach is use existing securities laws, use existing anti-money laundering um, frameworks as we've done in Hong Kong to sort of as a starting point. But then, you know, in Dubai, UAE, VARA, which is the digital asset regulator here, is being really forward thinking. They're saying, no, existing regulatory frameworks are not sufficient to regulate this new asset class. And they're actually putting their headquarters in the metaverse, looking to regulate digital assets on chain alongside the crypto exchanges and crypto businesses, because actually blockchains will do most of the heavy lifting for you. It's just that we are not there yet. Everything is not yet operating on chain. But when it does, there's not going to be any lags in financial reporting. Quarterly reports are going to be a thing of the past. Um, and we are moving to that inflection point. But, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. And um, so, yes, I would say FTX brings urgency to regulators. But it also gave really good sort of example to regulators of what can go wrong and sort of unknown things that, that can happen so that they can actually use it as an example of how to create um, comprehensive frameworks. So, you know, unfortunately, what they say is true. You really learn your greatest lessons from the greatest mistakes. And so I think that is definitely a silver lining for FTX. Paul, do you think the regulators have learned the, from this great mistake in terms of what's just happened? Uh, and this could lead to a more practical approach on how to deal with the space and how to regulate the space? Yeah, I think, I think in the U.S., I mean, you know, there's just been a lot of just push, um, you know, to, to find some sort of regulation here. You know, I think FTX, even Grayscale, I mean, what's going on with 
you know, GBTC and ETHE, basically, you know, sort of creating a, a scenario where retail investors are going into cryptocurrency yet, you know, don't have any sort of liquidity because of just, you know, non-regulation around ETFs. Um, you know, and then of course, like, you know, uh, all the other stuff that's, that's kind of happened uh, where there's a lot of, you know, regulation, but it's really just by enforcement. And so recently, you know, the U.S. government or the SEC issued Coinbase a Wells notice uh, saying, hey, we're, you know, going to sort of take a look into what you're doing. And Coinbase came back and decided to sue the, uh, the SEC saying, hey, like, how do you expect us to do anything regarding regulations if you don't give us any sort of clarity? And of course, Grayscale is also suing the SEC. So uh, there's, you know, there's some momentum around really just saying, hey, like, you know, this has got to stop. I mean, the all FTX thing, you know, was, was really caused by sort of forcing a company to go offshore and then of course, you know, giving them a, l a little bit of rope to potentially do, you know, fraudulent things and then not getting regulated. And so uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the opportunity now for a push to get some sort of regulatory clarity by the end of the year. But then also, uh, you know, we've done over 225 investments and 60% of our investments are offshore. And it's offshore because everyone's setting up entities outside the United States, seeing opportunities in Dubai, Hong Kong, um, you know, um, you know, other, other areas like you know, Gibraltar, et cetera. And everybody that's launching a token is setting up foundations in Switzerland and, and, and anywhere else but the United States. So the United States is really losing on opportunity to really kind of bring innovation and entrepreneurship inside. And I actually think, you know, Dubai and the Middle East is really just becoming a huge benefactor of, you know, more clear regulations, uh, especially for centralized entities that are trying to provide access for retail and institutions into this space. And I also think that there's an opportunity around Web3 and decentralized finance, uh, you know, for Dubai to really sort of, you know, open up to foundations and DAOs and really kind of, you know, if there's a little bit more clarity on how to set up an organization here, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are going to come here and really set up shop. And I think there's an opportunity to really just, you know, from an economic perspective, but also from an innovation perspective, really push the space forward. I want to shift the focus. We spoke about uh, regulation. And Jonathan, with you, I want to shift the focus on what the SVB fallout means for the ecosystem, startup ecosystem. And of course, FinTech is a part of it. In terms of, given that now funding is scarce, capital is scarce, what happens? How is this going to push existing startups in terms of focusing on profitability? Is this going to mark a shift where they start looking at profitability and be more disciplined about spending going ahead? I, I, I'm not sure that SVB per se is really the um, major issue in terms of liquidity for startups or access to capital for startups or access to capital for funds. Because uh, SVB still is in business. Um, as I said earlier, time will tell whether they're able to operate at the same level they did before. We certainly know from HSBC in the UK, uh, who has acquired SVB, and interestingly, SVB you know, was a disproportionately important supplier to the entire entrepreneurial sector in the UK. We know that they at least have stated they intend to continue the value proposition and support that SVB was providing to um, the entrepreneurial sector. I think the broader issue, however, is just that we're now in a very different world. And I think interest rates at 5% plus <laughs> are just a d totally different reality from interest rates at zero. Um, and it's just a night and day universe. Uh, you can get, you know, 6% with investment grade debt right now uh, with, by taking, you know, a diversified portfolio of pretty modest risk. Uh, you can get much, much higher than that with risks that are quite predictable and that many people would find <laughs> acceptable if diversified. And I think that just raises the bar to a completely different point as to you know, what the expectations of investors are and how much risk they're willing to take. And I think therefore, um, you know, we're in a very constrained funding environment. Uh, why do you want to lock up your money for seven to 10 years when you can make these 
uh, relatively liquid investments and still make an acceptable yield. You can make a higher yield if you leverage them, if you have access to low-cost funds. So I think that's just the reality. Um, I also think that you know, we've seen massive volatility in the valuations of, uh, firstly, both private companies pre-IPO, and then secondly, mostly as a result of the SPAC boom um, a year and a half ago, uh, a massive volatility in the valuations of companies that uh, went public via SPAC or DSPAC. And um, I think that um, that volatility has actually collapsed the valuations of entire sectors. InsureTech in our industry would be a very good example. It's fortunately for us as an investor, as a sector that we stayed largely away from, uh, almost entirely away from. So I think there are um, just, there's a much broader set of causes for why we are in a you know, far more constrained capital environment than these financial institution collapses. And I think even if those financial institutions hadn't collapsed, we'd be still grappling with. Now, to your point, there's a fundamental um, uh, uh, focus now on um, financial performance. And the idea that you can simply um, burn vast amounts of capital uh, in the hope that at some point your scale somehow translates into profitability, no one's willing to believe that anymore. And therefore, I think there's a very different level of discipline. Um, I actually think it's pretty healthy. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, the, the reality is that if you look at series A companies, there's like a one in 20 to one in 30 ratio of those companies that will survive to, let's say, series C. And then from series C, for the companies that are gonna get to between, let's say, 20 to 50 or more million dollars of revenue, there's probably another one in 30 uh, ratio versus those companies from Series C, very unlikely to just die, but more likely to just tread water um, if they don't really grow. So I, th I think that the, the discipline of focusing on unit economics, of deploying cash in a way where you have clarity as to the return, um, and of just using capital in a far more disciplined and rationed way, I personally think it's a pretty healthy thing and, uh, and probably an overdue reset for uh, fintech, but also for startup companies in general. Um, and I think for us at least, we're beginning to see um, much more rational valuations and entry points for high quality companies that have actually built a franchise, that have gone from some version of, you know, from zero to some version of one, as we like to think about it. And what we're trying to do is provide growth capital to accelerate growth from there. So we're starting to see companies um, uh, at, a, at acceptable and addressable valuations uh, in, in the spaces that we invest, which is fintech and digital health. We have a particular bias for B2B investments, especially investments that have to do with helping the financial industry, the incumbent financial industry, retool for the digital age internally and externally. So we're actually quite optimistic about where we are right now, and we think the vintage of investment from here this year and next year is probably going to be a very attractive one for disciplined investors. Well, as you can see, William Johnson is very optimistic, and uh, he says this is a healthy sign. From where you sit, how are you viewing this? You have high interest rates. Of course, an incident like SVB has happened. Startups are worried about the funding situation. Where you, how do you see this panning out, and is this really a bright spot? Yeah, so venture capital has outperformed every other asset class in the world uh, eight out of the last 10 years. Uh, and so when you have high interest rates, you know, people are getting a pretty good return. Uh, in the private space, uh, you know, venture capital, where we are, uh, is generally the place to be. Now, we're early stage venture capital, which people generally actually think is high risk. And it is high risk, but unless you can actually, actually capture the entire asset class. Um, now, we're focused on uh, the third layer of risk. We're focused on emerging frontier markets uh, where you never know where your next check is going to come from. So because of that, we're very much focused on positive unit economics. So anything that somebody does that does not return, you know, you put a dollar in, you don't get more than a dollar back. That's still an experiment. You don't scale experiments, right? Uh, I'm not a big fan of blitzscaling because, uh, well, as a former uh, a SoftBank VC, uh, before Vision, uh, we didn't really believe in it. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not with SoftBank Vision. We were way back in the early days when we were writing one, two, three million dollar checks. So what, what, what is the focus now? So positive unit economics, 
for us as a VC, um, we have a, a very large team, 50 people on our team, and we have back-end access to the analytics for the companies that we're working with. And like week by week by week, uh, we're helping them uh, get to positive being economics, right? But you know, you need to you know do your own work. We're in a very special position to do our own work because we have back-end access to our portfolio companies' analytics. It's actually easier to build a business than it is to fake your analytics. Um, it's very difficult to fake. Um, and uh, and then so that's the second thing. The third thing is it's a lot easier to raise money when you don't need it, right? So if you have positive unit economics, if you can are in sort of this sort of go break even anytime you want situation, then people will give you money uh, in good markets and bad markets. Uh, so uh, I've been doing investment now 27 years uh, in tech and uh, this is not the first cycle. So we actually wait for these cycles um, for blockchain and crypto. We didn't do anything in 2020, 2021, but the last uh, you know, five quarters we've been quite active. Um, because there's a lot of great companies out there and there's not a lot of competition in this market. That's very interesting. As you said that in the crypto space you didn't do anything in the last five quarters have been no, no, Pretty. I, I, uh, last 2020, 2021, zero. Zero, okay. And then, and then in the last five quarters, uh, 10 investments. In the crypto space? In the crypto space, yeah. Okay, so that, that's a good point to bring you in, Lucy and I. Uh, we have just three minutes left, I have to get concluding remarks. So let's start with the crypto space. Uh, given that what we have discussed just now in terms of the event and in terms of where regulation is, how do you see now the next phase of crypto panning out, let's say in the next three or four years? Where do you see the industry heading from here? Um, well, given that I run a crypto VC fund, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> otherwise, You've I got a lot I'm, of optimistic people here. It's a good sign. I think sign. I'm yeah. uh, in, in the wrong role otherwise. Um, no, but joking aside, you know, I've been watching how this space has been innovating over the last six years. I mean, it's really been incredible. And, you know, if I was sitting at a crypto conference five years ago, um, there would be very few people. It would probably be a side event and if it was part of a fintech um, you know, uh, summit. But now it's sort of headlines, right? Now the Hong Kong regulators involved. Now Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, it's, it takes mainstream news media every day. Bitcoin's alive and kicking. Global adoption continues. Global adoption of crypto is continuing. Um, you know, we're at over 400 million crypto um, holders now today. Um, so regardless, it's quite amazing if you, if you take a step back and look at the negativity and what everyone says about it and how they sort of FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt of the industry. But yet regardless, it gets larger and larger every year through bear markets, through bull markets, and actually it's drawing more and more players in. I think the very exciting um, inflection point that's coming up, I think the traditional financial institutions are going to be meaningful in this space coming, for, uh, coming up in the next year or so. Um, an example is JP Morgan. They have been working um, on internal crypto projects for over five years. They have their own stable coin. They've built their own blockchains. But what's most exciting now is that they are tokenizing bank accounts with a view to putting institutional and retail bank accounts on chain and they call it tokenized deposits, but while it's going to start in a walled garden, as in your bank account will be tokenized, the vision is to have those tokens, bank deposits that have been tokenized, start interacting with public blockchains and open source DeFi protocols, and yet they'll still remain within banking regulations and all the capital requirements that, that are in there after GFC and, and Basel 1, 2, 3, or 4. I'm not sure what we're on now. So that is going to be the big watershed moment because once you've got your bank account on chain, all the innovation that you can start taking control of because they're going to give you power and um, you know, you're going to self-custody those assets is going to be really the game changer because then interacting with decentralized financial services, understanding how to sort of piece together different composable um, industries is going to take this space to the next level. Well, the gong, that's the gong. So that's the cue for us to end this very engaging discussion. Well, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts. Lots, lots, uh, lots to take away from here, especially given what has happened. But one thing is very clear that you all are optimistic about your respective spaces and you think things can only get better from here. So please give a big round of applause for this panel, which had so much to share. Thank you so much for your thoughts. <laughs>
Thank you, and that concludes the session. Thank you.